There are two critical reasons to really address global governance. The first one is that we actually live in a world of crisis. We have rising inequalities, we have challenges of dealing with potential disastrous climate risks, we have a rising uncharted, uncontrolled development of a digital revolution that can help us but could also pose new risks. Global governance are all the attempts for us collectively as humanity to deal with human challenges. Governance today is a patchwork. There is um, no clear system to deal collectively with global challenges that arise in this era of globalization on the social, economic and ecological sphere. The United Nations was established in another era. We need Global Governance 2.0. Nation states emerged roughly 200 years ago as one form of governance. Now we truly need the emergence of a new form of global governance. In May this year, in Stockholm, we will be for the first time seeing the presentation of the first ever international prize for new ideas on global governance, the New Shape Prize, the New Shape Forum and a dialogue for the prize for the future. And this may actually change the entire conversation on global governance in the world. Technology is a game changer. Technology plays a fundamental role in finding solutions, but also impacting and influencing our opportunities of global governance. So the question is, which way will we go on the role of technology for global governance? Well, sadly, there are more than I would like there, more risks than I would like there to be. Um, at the Future of Life Institute, we tend to look more at the existential risks, so the risks that could completely wipe out humanity. Um, and those are climate change, potentially biotechnology, nuclear weapons, artificial intelligence. Um, we're also concerned about uh, the development of lethal autonomous weapons, um, which is hopefully not quite as existential, but it could still be mm. devastating to uh, the way uh, uh, it could be destabilizing. Climate change is, um, I, one of the biggest concerns that we have with it is that it's a threat multiplier. So we know that it can um, increase the risks of, uh, you know, temperatures obviously increasing. It's going to uh, have a negative impact on farming. People are more likely to face issues of starvation. Uh, they'll be we're worried about loss of homes as a result of flooding. We saw the, the fires in California. Um, and all of this can, as devastating as it is, can lead to other problems. So we can see increased risks of disease spreading, increased risks of pandemics. Um, the the uh, effect of people having to leave their homes and become refugees elsewhere is obviously uh, a problem. Um, and all of these can also make it more likely that we have see more wars. Um, so biotechnology is another issue that we're, we're interested in. Um, this is one that's, it, it, it's, there's so much potential with biotechnology to help improve lives around the world, to save lives around the world, um, that we don't want to worry about, we don't want the technology to be hampered, but at the same time, we're worried about um, you know, can, can a disease that scientists are working on spread accidentally? Can it, can it escape the lab? Um, can we see something like a gene drive where we're trying to eliminate some species? Can that have some sort of secondary effect? Um, there's also issues of inequality rising as a result of maybe some people can uh, afford these benefits that biotechnology provides, but not everyone can, and that's just going to increase this um, the, the, the inequality gap where you have the rich getting more and more and the poor being left behind. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, new biotechnology weapons that could become even more uh, devastating. Um, and then speaking of weapons, we deal a lot with nuclear weapons. And it's pretty obvious that those are devastating. We saw what happened in Japan. Um, it's something that everyone fears. 
and yet we still have thousands of nuclear weapons. And there's this feeling that most of the countries in the world do not want nuclear weapons, but there's still a few countries in the world that are, are dead set on keeping them. Um, and the effects of nuclear weapons, I, I think it's easy to think that the country that's attacked by a weapon is the one that will suffer, um, but there's no reason to believe that's the case. Uh, certainly, uh, we have an app at the Future of Life Institute where you can look at historic targets that the U.S. used to have in Russia. And um, we worked with Alex Wellerstein, who, who ran some models based on what some wind patterns were like on given days. And they found that um, depending on what the wind pattern was like and where the nuclear weapon went off in what was an enemy country, uh, radioactive fallout could still you know, blow into neighboring countries who are our allies. So e even just something simple and localized, it can, it can have an effect in other countries. And then, of course, there's the risk of nuclear winter. And so if we have even a small nuclear war between, say, India and Pakistan, um, the, the smoke and uh, debris and, uh, uh, you know, it, it can all rise high up into the atmosphere um, and it can block the sun. And we can, the, with a small nuclear war, I believe, uh, temperatures are estimated to drop about 5 to 10 degrees Celsius, and that could last for a few years. With a larger nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia, say, where thousands of weapons are used, um, we could see drops in temperature by as much as 20 degrees Celsius, and that could last for a decade or more. And that would just, the farming would be devastated, we would lose food, we would see mass starvation. Um, so these, these are big issues where the war might be between two countries, but it would be global in, in the catastrophic results. Artificial intelligence is really exciting because there's so many great things that could, could be developed. Um, it can improve healthcare. We're seeing a lot with self-driving cars where that could save a lot of lives that way. Um, but there's also this huge risk. We're already seeing issues today of bias. We're seeing issues of discrimination. And that's just with these smaller programs that Google is using or you know, Facebook is using. We have to worry about what happens as artificial intelligence gets smarter. Um, how do we make sure that AI is aligned with our goals? Um, there's uh, Stuart Russell, who's an AI researcher, likes to talk about the King Midas problem in that King Midas thought he wanted uh, everything he touched to turn to gold. But then, you know, it killed his daughter, he couldn't eat food, et cetera. So what he thought he wanted wasn't actually what he wanted. Um, and we need to be really careful about issues like that when we're programming AI that's much smarter. Um, we're worried about uh, what could happen if there's a race to develop the technology. Will we be as concerned about safety issues? Um, or will companies be trying to just develop whatever they can to be the first? Um, and we're seeing, in terms of race, a similar issue with lethal autonomous weapons. Um, we, don't, we, we worry that we could enter another weapons race with lethal autonomous weapons. And do we want weapons to be deciding who dies? Uh, is that something that we want to do? And, and Robin, you, you, you spend your life at, at uh, following and understanding emerging frontiers of technology. What, what's your take on the role of technology for global governance? Where do you see categories of opportunity? It should be obvious that it would be great to have better global governance. <laughs> that should be an easy thing. But the thing that's hard to imagine is, well, how? How could we make better global governance? It's easy to make lists of exciting new technologies, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, drones, blockchains, uh, space colonization, et cetera. The hard thing is to say, yeah, but how could those things actually help global governance. Now, one thing to, be, to realize is technology has been helping global governance ever since World War II and before. That is, as travel gets cheaper, as talking gets cheaper, people who are involved in global governance are better able to go around and have meetings, to have phone calls, to interact and Skype. Uh, that has made global governance more feasible. In addition, uh, the development of computers and data technologies means that we are better able to make records, better able to exchange drafts of proposals, better able to collect data and to analyze it. And so the internal processes of these organizations, even if the outside looks the same, they are better able to have new meeting technology, new ways to share documents and edit them. Um, and 
the space of policy options has increased in general for all forms of governance. That is, uh, policy can now depend on more details that can be observed because we have more ways to collect data. Policy can act in more ways, and for example, in automated ways that um, could, would be too expensive before. And we can have more complicated mappings between uh, the data and the actions in terms of we can have complicated algorithms and we can base it on a complicated analysis. Those are all ways in which technology has been improving and enabling global governance. Now, you, but you still might say, well, yeah, but <laughs> how much can that be? And uh, it's definitely seems to, it seems that global governance has a strong preference, at least over the last half century, for relatively weak, informal, opaque, even deniable institutions. <laughs> uh, ordinary governance of nations or cities or states uh, tends to have more explicit rules, more strong rules, more strong penalties, and allows those governments then to take stronger actions and stronger policies. We haven't been willing to do that so much over the last half century in global governance. We mostly have a number of relatively informal, weak organizations whose main effort is to say shame people or to promote norms, which has an effect, but it's weak. So you might think, well, to what extent can technology produce new institutions or new ways to organize global governance? Um, now, in, in the light of the sort of weak institutions we have, which are mo mostly, say, information gathering and, and expectation creating, we have new kinds of institutions like that that are available. Uh, that is, we can now have wikis <laughs> that aggregate information together that people can find. We have prediction markets or betting markets where people can uh, commonly create expectations. We have new systems of voting rules, for example, or auctions, uh, with even combinatorial auctions or complicated voting rules. Those are all new technologies that are available for inclusion in an institution. However, be because these institutions have been pretty informal, uh, there's an obstacle there. So that brings me to some of the key obstacles that we face in trying to improve global governance with technology. And one of the main ones seems to be uh, when technologists uh, think about creating better governance institutions, which they often do, they tend to imagine that current governance is corrupt because it's opaque and they tend to try to generate open, explicit institutions with open rules and visible processes and visible inputs. And that's exactly what global governance tends to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that creates somewhat of an obstacle. Uh, the technologies that people generate for governance <laughs> tend to be not the sort of ones that people want to use. I'm so curious, I think many are, are really you know, seeking the answer to the following perhaps impossible question, but on one of your obstacles about transparency, I think most of us, when we think about global governance, we think about public sector, open governance in, 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 the, in the democratic institutional setting, not uh, global governance run by technology companies in the private domain. I mean, are, are you worried about the trend that technology is increasingly controlled by a few let's say, private giants in the world? Or, and, and how? What, what's your personal reflection on that? Well, you should be worried both about global governance that's controlled by a small group that you can't influence. Right. You should also be worried about a lack of global governance <laughs> at all. So, you know, in a sense, many technology companies have produced global governance that was effective in the absence of government, uh, effective global governance. So, for example, the Wi-Fi standard. If governments had had committees to work on that, they'd still be working on it and still be negotiating what the standard would be. But a, a company just produced the standard. A few companies agreed on the standard and they pushed it and then the whole world is now using it. And that's, in a sense, better than the telephone standards or the or railroad standards where the world didn't manage to agree on a common standard elsewhere. So you might, and if company, social media companies like Facebook are creating global um, authentication and identification where nations have failed to produce those things, and even credit card companies are producing those things. And so uh, it might be a trade-off between getting the problem solved somehow mm. or getting it solved through the institution you would prefer, which often is kind of slow, cumbersome, and ineffective. Marcella, and, and of course one of the 
really most exciting frontiers is, is in the blockchain, blockchain. technology. And, 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 and the poster child here is really Bitcoin. And, and we talk about blockchain technology all the time. And there is this, uh, uh, in, in a way, intuitive sense that blockchain technology should be something that can contribute to more transparent global governance. Mm -hmm. Please explain to us what is this magic around blockchain and how, and how could that technology support oh, or, or, or even be at risk for global governance? Basically, what the blockchain does is to allow people, entities, companies who don't trust or don't know each other to safely interact on a large scale at global level. And this is amazing because the transactions between parties are not executed by a third party like governments, like banks or other trusted authorities. They are actually regulated through algorithmic protocols. Mm -hmm. And once these protocols are set up, they work automatically, in theory, without human intervention anymore. So it is really a disruptive paradigm that can have very strong effect in the way individuals interact at global level and can disrupt our current model of governance and can have both positive and negative effect. That mm -hmm. will depend on the quality of the implementation, so it will depend on the blockchain governance itself. On the positive side, we can say that um, the biggest advantage of the blockchain is it enables new collaborative models of governance. So uh, individuals can uh, uh, set up their own uh, networks, make their own ecosystems, and uh, achieve their own goals. And this is fantastic because it allows a bottom-up approach also to decision-making in politics, for example. And uh, uh, decision-making can become so more responsive, more transparent, more accountable. And this is a very positive thing. I'd like to recall something that Paul Virilio, who is a French uh, sociologist, wrote in an essay many decades ago now, <laughs> 20 years ago, but still valid. Mm. Um, technology always has a dark side. He said, when uh, we invented the ship, we invented also the shipwreck. When we invented the train, we invented the train crash, the train accident. So this applied to any technology and it particularly applied to the blockchain. I'd like to underline this because today we enthusiastically push this technology, sometimes with no adequate uh, consideration about his dark side. So the question is, does the blockchain have a dark side? Of, of course it does, and it affects mostly the blockchain governance and the way, the democratic rules behind. Um, the new mechanism of governance based uh, on the blockchain entails a big, enormous shift of powers from central institutions, from democratic institutions based on universal suffrage, to individuals and markets. And this has uh, some risks. Uh, for example, if uh, we have a too fast disempowerment of democratic institutions, we risk uh, an extreme individualism in the civil society. Citizens may start to feel they are not part of the whole anymore. Mm -hmm. And this can be dangerous. So when we apply the blockchain, we always have to take also this into in consideration and uh, avoid that the, the blockchain services uh, push the triumph of, of relativism or even worse, a gamification of politics. So we can imagine a future better global governance and we can imagine two kinds of scenarios that could mm. create it, a push or a pull. Mm. The pull would be there's some wonderful new technology for governance and everybody says, wow, that's so great. Let's try to adopt that because it looks you know, so powerful. A push would be there's a crisis, a problem mm -hmm. that needs to be solved and people start to say, we really need to do something and then they go looking for some solution that might be available. So what do you think? Are we more likely to get better global governance through push or pull? That's a good question. I mean, if you, if, you look, if you look at contemporary history of humanity, it has clearly been driven by push. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been very good at rising after, after catastrophes. I mean, so basically our global governance structures we have today rose from the crisis of the Second World War. So, so this is something that we're, so to say, very talented at, at, at kind of uh, being at the push mode. 
But I mean, if you look, if you take my perspective from a planetary perspective, we can, for the first time in humanity's existence on planet Earth, not allow ourselves to rise after disaster because that will be irreversible. We cannot allow the green and ice sheet to melt and then wake up a morning and say, let's push ourselves to global governance because we cannot refreeze it. So, of course, for this moment in time, we have to be proactive. And I think that goes for nuclear yes. war. It goes from, from, for much of the deep inequities in the world that we, we need to somehow find that pull factor. And that, Are there that smaller be, pushes that could trigger the effort? Could be. Pull? Could be. Uh, yes, of course. Those be? I mean, can yeah. You imagine? yeah. Well, I think what, what you're exploring in terms of before they become existential disasters, global risks, mm -hmm. when we see a battery of extreme weather events, uh, pandemics that actually raise red flags here and there, uh, risks of, and, and I think that the awareness that you're flagging here, said that as we, we need knowledge on uh, new emerging technologies to be able to assess them, understand their risks, and thereby be proactive through, through pushes. I, I think you're right. And, and this kind of cross-scale interaction there is key to get communities to act bottom-up on, on how to navigate and, and govern in a way that adds up to global governance. <laughs> I think the political system tends to be quite reactive, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, time, time runs. This is such an interesting conversation. There, there's no doubt that we are at, 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 a, at a very important juncture for humanity's future on Earth. I mean, we are at an all-time high in terms of global risks, but we're also just at the starting point of, a, of an exponential journey in new technologies of a digital fourth industrial revolution. And, and clearly, this is just the start of, of a conversation. And um, in May, there is an opportunity of joining us for the first time rewarding the new Shape Price innovations for global governance. There's over 2,000 entries in this competition, which will be held for the first time ever, which will clearly be a starting point for innovations and exploring transitions into a, a, a humane, sustainable, equitable global governance regime. Thank you so much for joining this conversation, and um, let's um, continue working for sustainable healthy, equitable global governance in the world. Thank you.